Thank you, Dr. McKinney. Um, I want to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to uh, this workshop. I've really learned a lot in the last uh, day plus, and I particularly want to give a shout out to Winston Wong uh, because he's a graduate of the UC Berkeley UCSF Joint Medical Program. Uh, and I, it's not listed on the program, but I have to, to uh, disclose I'm also the physician member of the California Resources Board. I think I said that yesterday. So I actually have some regulatory uh, responsibilities with regard to air quality and climate change, though you know, wildfires uh, are not a regulated source, but they do impact our air quality. So I was asked to speak about the response with regard to respiratory and cardiovascular health in urban populations basically downwind from wildfires. And uh, many of you in this room, I'm sure, have uh, seen the wildfire smoke guide for public health officials that is a US EPA, CDC, and I think California Department of Public Health joint uh, least sponsored document. A new version is coming out. Uh, I think it's in sort of final review. Uh, but the basic point of this document is to try to give information, usable information, to county public health officials about how to deal, how to respond to bad air quality due to wildfire smoke. And, you know, public education is, is key. Uh, and so it recommends adequate medication supply for patients uh, of all types, but in particular, uh, those with heart and lung disease, have a written asthma plan, uh, and discusses portable air cleaners, and you make sure to buy them in advance before fire season, uh, and to always contact a health your healthcare provider if your condition work worsens, and only use appropriate respiratory protection. And then you see on the slide somebody wearing an N95 correctly versus incorrectly. We're going to talk about masks down the road in my presentation here. So, um, how does the public health response get initiated? Well. Uh, there are public health advisories from the US e based on the US EPA Air Quality Index. And uh, again, most of you know about this index. And you know, good is it green, zero to 50. Uh, moderate is yellow, 51 to 100. Then unhealthy for sensitive groups like people with heart and lung disease, 101 to 150, that's red. And then when it gets to purple, it's unhealthy for everybody. Now, what's wrong with this picture? Well, sir, walking in LA, which is not supposed to happen, right? Uh, there was a song about that in my day. Uh, so the, they're outside, the whole family's outside, they'd be better off inside, and they're all wearing N95 masks, and I think maybe properly, though I doubt if they've been fitted properly, and the kids are wearing the N95s, and you know, N95s aren't recommended for children. But there's the issue about the AQI. Uh, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, and I'm not speaking for them here, uh, but I have been to a conference where they, you know, it was in Santa Rosa, uh, after the uh, Tubbs fire, uh, and they don't actually necessarily think the AQI is right for wildfire. Uh, public health advisories. Why? Well, the AQI reflects fine particulate matter, PM 2.5, but not in a linear fashion. So when you hear uh, that the AQI is 200, that makes me, an air pollution health effects researcher, think, oh, 200 micrograms per meter cube that, of PM 2.5, that's a lot. But it actually is more like 70 at 200. I mean, don't quote me on that, but it's it's not anywhere near as bad as it sounds. And uh, the risk bins, again, are somewhat arbitrary. Uh, and in the warm season, which is when we have a lot of our wildfires, there might be high ozone 
too. And AQI actually is based on ozone and PM 2.5, both. And so, uh, for example, uh, in the 2008 wildfire, Northern California wildfire season, my former doctoral student, Colleen Reed, spoke about our research uh, during that season. There was a lot of PM 2.5, but it was also really high ozone because it was hot, uh, sort of stagnant air. During the campfire in November, that was all PM 2.5 and the AQI. But, you know, in the summer, it's a different story. And it's actually based on a 24-hour uh, PM 2.5 level, even though they report it hourly. So it's, it's actually a funky uh, way to, to assess air quality relate, relating to a wildfire. I don't have a replacement, though. <laughs> Um, you know, what I would like to use is micrograms per meter cubed because uh, I, I understand the health effects of that and what those levels mean. So I was I invited to, uh, to a conference in um, Vancouver in February. British Columbia, the British Columbia CDC is actually very good about assessing evidence about how to respond to wildfires. I was very impressed. Uh, they gave me the task of talking about um, public service messaging. Uh, and it, I was happy to do that. I gave 32 interviews after the campfire. Uh, I, you know, it's been very um, sobering to hear from folks that were dealing directly with Paradise survivors uh, in Chico. Uh, in the Bay Area, you know, people were freaking out, excuse my technical term, about the bad air. Um, but you know, really nothing like uh, folks nearer to the fire and people caught in the fire. So in any event, when I had to give this talk, uh, I, I found out that the, the people that asked me to give the talk had already done a very careful evidence review. Um, this was British Columbia CDC about public service advisories. And so they did a review of the literature up until about 2013 or 2012, 2013. So I could just review the literature after that. But what their review said was that there was limited evidence in the peer-reviewed literature about how effective public service messages are about wildfire smoke. No surprise, what is in the literature, simple and non-technical messages are best uh, re recalled. Some populations are less likely to hear this, this messaging. That was, the panel yesterday talked about that. Uh, if English isn't your primary language, uh, if you're uh, poor, uh, you may not have access to the, the same access to public service advisories. Compliance is best for stay indoors and reduce outdoor physical activity. If you get more technical than that, people tend not to uh, recall what they're supposed to do or actually do it. And then recall and compliance depend on sociodemographics, which I've already alluded to. And yet, you know, yesterday that was brought home. So there are some more recent papers. Uh, this one was about the San Diego fires in 2007. They had 1,800 respondents, so that's a pretty good survey. Uh, most people remembered hearing uh, fire-related health messages and understanding them. And again. They, com they complied with the non-technical messages about staying inside, avoiding outdoor exercise, and keeping windows closed, but not the technical ones like uh, use HEPA filters, turn your air conditioner to recirculate. And you know, less than 10% of all respondents followed the specific recommendations. So this is, this is a, you know, a little reality testing. This is from uh, an Australian group. They have, they have bushfires in Australia. They're just as bad as ours, uh, our wildfires. And they tr tried to use Twitter data uh, to see what, it's sort of like the smoke sense that uh, Anna Rapold has uh, pioneered with US EPA. But they, uh, f they analyzed data f uh, from Twitter and found that they could get a sense of where the fires were impacting people. And uh, respondents seemed to like this better 
at least those that are plugged into Twitter, liked it better than um, public service advisories on, on other media. And then I just mentioned uh, Anna Rapold, she did some interesting work with other EPA colleagues. Wayne Castillo was here yesterday. Uh, they simulated the effectiveness of public health forecast-based interventions, meaning uh, they uh, had a North Carolina county that had been affected by wildfires, and they wanted to uh, see if they had gotten people to comply with the messaging to stay indoors, uh, what that would have done in terms of asthma and congestive heart failure, healthcare utilization. Uh, and they, you know, this was a modeling study, this wasn't real data, but they found that if you got a message out early on when the PM 2.5 was relatively low at 20 micrograms per meter cubed, and you got people to comply, that that would have the greatest health benefit. Uh, so we have some data from California, actually. The best data with regard to a few things uh, is from the Hoopa uh, tribe in 1999, and these were CDC investigators, US CDC investigators. There was a large fire that burned for two months and had bad air quality. They were measuring PM10 back then, a uh, little bit bigger particles. Uh, and they were able to assess healthcare utilization and lower respiratory illness uh, because all of the tribe members would go to only a few healthcare utilization, healthcare facilities. Uh, and it turned, they studied recollection of public service announcements. Uh, and if you remembered and did what the uh, public service announcement said, you had reduced respiratory health effects. This was an interesting study. They showed also, well, I'll move on to HEPA air cleaners. Uh, that was studied in that HOOPA uh, study as well. There, was, there is evidence that portable HEPA air cleaners uh, work very well for reducing PM 2.5 uh, in general, but there's actually even been some for studies of wildfire smoke. Uh, and this was one in uh, Colorado for the scribe burns. And then in that HOOPA study, they had a 46% res reported respiratory symptoms uh, if people used a portable air cleaner, HEPA air cleaner, and they were actually distributed in an experimental way. How many minutes does that say? Three, okay. Uh, and they showed that N95 masks didn't make any difference at all in terms of respiratory symptoms, presumably because people then went outdoors. And then there's, you know, but there are some evidence if you wear the masks, uh, you can reduce respiratory symptoms. So, Masks, uh, problematic. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in my last few minutes. The portable HEPA filtration devices, these actually work for a room. Uh, there's an example of one. Uh, clean air shelters, no data. Evacuation, there's no evidence of effectiveness. And actually, people that were evacuated from the Hoopa tribe actually during that fire to Eureka, I believe, to motels, they actually didn't have any reduction in respiratory symptoms, probably because they weren't evacuated for the entire time of the two months. So we've been talking about university responses in the previous panel. Uh, so UC Berkeley, where I work, uh, after the Tubbs fire, uh, the Friday, October 13th, was our worst day air quality-wise. Uh, and again, while Napa, close to the fire, had 200 micrograms per meter cube to PM 2.5, it was only 70 at Oakland. Uh, people were freaking out. I did less than 32 interviews then, but I did double digits. Uh, and UC Berkeley issued a, an email uh, to all of the faculty and staff saying, you know, there's a poor air quality, stay inside, uh, don't exercise outside, wear an N95 if you have to, and, uh, but they didn't cancel classes. The Bay Area Air Quality Management District asked UC Berkeley to cancel the televised football game with Washington State that afternoon, and what did Berkeley do? The game didn't cancel, it wasn't canceled, 
because the NCAA says you don't have to cancel a game unless it gets to uh, 200, and by kickoff it was like just below 200. One of the dance team members was in a class of mine. I was actually lecturing that the day before about uh, air, public uh, air quality to a public health class. She asked me, you know, can I, should I be out there? What can I do when I'm out there uh, during the game? I said, well, they let you wear an N95 mask. And they said, no, they actually forbade, forbade it because it's going to be on TV. Anyway, so Berkeley did learn a bit of a lesson. Uh, there was a lot of outcry about not canceling classes. Uh, this is the campfire, and you can see the plume coming down from Butte County going right out the bay. And the AQI uh, went over 200 that evening, November 14th, projected to stay high. So Berkeley canceled classes but did not close campus. Why? Because some of the campus buildings are really clean. So, uh, you know, the building that I work is a brand new building. Winston's been there. And uh, we actually measured in my office the levels of uh, PM 2.5, and they were really low because it's a brand new building, well filtered. So they did postpone the big game with Stanford uh, on Saturday, November 16th. So they learned a bit of a lesson. I'm going to end with Sacramento. Uh, so that should be 2018. I keep forgetting to change that. But anyway, this is after the, the uh, campfire. And you could see the purple area going down, including Sacramento. Uh, I was actually in Sacramento that day for a monthly meeting of the California Resources Board, and it was bad. The city of Sacramento was giving free N95 masks, but the county health department advised against wearing N95 masks because of a false sense of protection uh, and I actually did walking back from the California Resources Board facility, uh, Kelly PA building to the train station, uh, I did see somebody jogging with an N95. Uh, and then there was a concern about safety from the health department that people with pre-existing heart and lung disease wouldn't be able to tolerate uh, wearing N95. That's really not correct information. The, the work of breathing does not increase substantially wearing N95. Now it's uncomfortable, nobody likes to wear them, um, but they're really not much of a risk to most people. I mean, somebody on oxygen, maybe, but your average patient with asthma, COPD, or heart disease can wear an N95 without any kind of physiologic... Uh, this has been studied, <laughs> actually. Um, I want to end up with my little mask thing here. Uh, Rob, Rob Brook, who is uh, a cardiologist who spent his career studying the cardiovascular effects of air pollution, uh, he was also at that conference in, in Vancouver, and he was supposed to talk about uh, masks and filters. And he basically did a back-of-the-envelope calculation. That's what's on the left there. Uh, and the bottom line is the number of people needed to treat to prevent one acute health care event uh, is about uh, 370,000 if you take all comers. So that means 370,000 people have to wear N95s to prevent one healthcare utilization event. That's, if you take people with pre-existing heart disease, it's only 12,000. And if you take the general public without any pre-existing heart and lung disease, it's like a million people have to wear N95 masks properly, properly to prevent one healthcare utilization. I'm gonna skip this. Uh, the fraction of the exposed population with a hospital admission attributed to wildfire smoke is small. Thus, the cost of implementing filtration-based interventions in every household far exceeds the economic benefits. These, the portable air cleaners work, but they cost you know 200 bucks a piece. So I'm going to conclude with uh, who, not everyone, people with pre-existing heart and lung disease, the ones we're most concerned about, when. Uh, that's unclear. The Anna Rapold study suggests early on, before th things get really bad, uh, how uh, education, education, education. Uh, and then I, I, 
what I recommend is uh, N95s for people with pre-existing heart and lung disease. Anybody else who wants to wear them, fine, but they're not really necessary uh, and or cost effective. And then portable air cleaners work really well for um, individual rooms. And I have more, but I'll stop there because I've already gone over my time.